Hey, hello everybody and welcome to Josie J's June. Um, we hope you're staying safe and healthy out there. Um, things, are, things are getting real in the world once again. Um, so there's a, a few housekeeping items that we just want to talk about quickly. So we have a code of conduct that is linked on our meetup page as well as in the description below. Um, and if you are in the, the comments or in the chat while we're streaming live, please know that we require you to abide by it. Um, just to try and keep as safe a space as possible. If you feel unsafe at any point in time or somebody has breached our code of conduct in your opinion, please let any of these lovely people know. Um, you'll find our, our details on the meetup page. Um, the, the link is in description as said, um, and we just want to thank one sponsor, um, which is Inesis for our um, streaming sponsorship. So thank you very, very much. We couldn't use the nice toys if you didn't help us. We appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't um, attended one of the recent Josie JS meetups, uh, you will find that this format is a little bit different. It's geared more towards a panel discussion with all of the organizers. That's primarily because we like hanging out and we like talking about tech stuff. And we're going to be talking about some more tech stuff today. Um, and we're going to, rather than struggling through getting people speaking, which is challenging, we thought we would we would um, shoot the breeze, so to speak. Um, and on to shooting the breeze, we're going to today be talking about privacy in general, and in specific, the cookie-less future. You might know of um, an initiative by Google called the Privacy Sandbox, which is basically just a, a broad container holding a whole bunch of standardized APIs and approaches and workarounds to improve privacy as a whole. Um, I think the, the 10,000 foot view is that cookies are at the very least going to be locked down in the short term, even further than they are currently, and ultimately will be deprecated. Um, so it's not a matter of if anymore, it's a matter of when, and finding what is a coarse grained enough use case for us to be able to deprecate cookies. Um, now, something that I'd like to cover before we, we get to talking about the specifics of stuff is the idea of privacy and whether privacy is Im important or not. And like the short answer of it is yes, and privacy is important to everyone because even if, if you don't mind giving up your privacy um, because you don't see that uh, or you, you don't mind necessarily being targeted and um, being fingerprinted, um, that's fine. But it's still important because the data that gets mined from your privacy settings is used to interact with or is to used to profile the people that you interact with. Um, so by you giving up your security, you, you're literally harming the people around you in your social circles. Um, and not to stretch a metaphor, and I apologize for the, the, the salient metaphor, uh, this is basically like vaccination and herd immunity. You know, everybody needs to get vaccinated if they can so that we can form some sort of herd privacy. So let's cover the basics. Um, cookies are fundamentally a way to propagate state in a stateless medium, which is HTTP, it lets you save a little granule of something um, on that user's browser and um, carries with it wherever that user goes. So how the cookie gets set is by something called a set-cookie header, uh, which comes from the server that is serving the content, be it HTML, JavaScript, CSS, images, whatever. Um, and this is fundamentally bound to HTTP because the cookie set from that origin will automatically and uh, um, transparently be returned to that origin, pushing that state backwards and forwards. You can create cookies via, via JavaScript, but those are a little rarer because they're far more locked down because the JavaScript sandbox is really advanced. Um, but in context of our discussion today, there are two broad types of cookies that we're going to talk about. The one is first party cookies and the other is third party cookies. So what do we mean by this? So first party cookies are cookies that you set from your own origin that you control for your own consumption. Um, and this could be stuff like your login session data. It could be um, personalization settings of users that you want to propagate in their browser. Um, and only if you do it properly and you specify, you, know, you log it, lock it down as secure and HTTP only, um, you will, <coughs> pardon me, um, only you will have access to it from your domain and you won't have access to it from JavaScript. 
So first party cookies are relatively safe. So we're going to take that and put it in a box for the moment and focus on the, the critical part that invades our privacy. And that's third party cookies. Now, the same mechanism happens where third party cookies get set by visiting um, another origin while you are on your own page. Um, and this could be, for example, a redirect for external authorization, so OAuth. Um, and some of the use cases are like behavioral tracking. Um, so what kinds of sites does this person visit? What kinds of things do they interact with? Um, advertising. So if you've got a, a page that is using a, a cookie from an advertising provider, when you go to another page that uses the same advertising provider, they share data. So they're sharing their advertising data for you, making it possible to um, serve you customized or potentially unwanted customized ads. Um, and then there are positive use cases for it as well. Uh, a big use case is something called conversion tracking, which I think we're going to delve into a little bit today, because it's a case of you, you've got uh, a campaign running on this part of the internet, uh, and when somebody clicks through on that advertising or goes to your website as a direct jump from the one to the other, the, the conversion tracking cookie goes along. Um, and it's a good way of trying to measure where people are accessing your website from. So it is a positive use case. Um, it can just be really, really badly misused because essentially it's feeding into that behavioral tracking model. Now, um, the typical standard of how this stuff ends up being used is something called a tracking pixel, where the, the provider that you link to will give you an image URL of a probably a one by one transparent pixel that loads up in the page. And that will then set cookies and potentially download additional scripts because it's, it's not an actual pixel. Um, and then we'll probably phone home to wherever the source of the, the, the cookie comes from. Um, so this, this is very, very useful in a mechanism called click-through conversion so that you can know where your traffic is coming from. And it's a very important um, use case for people that are in the the media business, which is a big part of the internet. Um, <clears throat> but there's this problem with, with sharing and ex, you know, exposing of behavioral data between different providers. Um, and typically, it's not just the tracking pixel alone. You'll find that there's a tracking pixel and an additional API mm -hmm. or query string parameters that you can send along with the tracking pixel that provides additional user data so that you can segment who's clicking on your ads and where they're going and that kind of thing. Um, which is a little invasive, but it's a common practice. And then the last thing that we're going to discuss, because it's very interesting, very old, um, and very important, is the idea of fingerprinting using the user agent string. Um, now, the user agent string, for most people, even me, looks completely like gobbledygook. Um, I can't simply parse what it is, but it gives enough uh, data in an unsecure manner, so in the, the headless section, um, to identify your device, your device version, your browser, your browser version, what operating system you're running. And if you take a look at all of that stuff in conjunction, um, you essentially end up being able to fingerprint users with a relatively high degree of fidelity. We're going to talk about some of the uh, mitigations of that that are coming down the wire later. So this is just a, an overview of the kinds of things that we're talking about. It's slightly simplistic, and I'm sure a lot of you are, are chewing your fingernails, thinking that I have oversimplified parts of it, but I think it just gives us a, a common framework. Um, so I'm going to now segue to the first topic that we're going to talk about, and Sheena is going to introduce and explain to us the conversion tracking API. Yeah, cool. Um, so I was looking around at various um, third-party cookie alternatives, and the conversion API is one of them. and um, Another one is called Flock. Um, so I figure it would be good to talk about both of them. I think Flock is a little bit simpler, so I might talk about that one first. Um, so basically, Flock stands for um, Federated Learning of Cohorts. I have to check because it's a weird thing, um, not too memorable. Um, but basically what it means is um, this thing has been rolled out, but only like to a small number of people. So it might be running on your device. It might not be. Who knows? Um, I think it's just Chrome. So basically what it does is it keeps track of all the different websites that you 
that you travel to on your browser. And every week it'll calculate an identifier that's unique to your browser. And it'll, and uh, well, it's not actually unique to your browser. It's, it's almost like a hash. So it's unique to a bunch of people's browsers, ideally. So like a couple of thousand people would have the same identifier and that's your cohort that, that you're in. Um, and that cohort will change over time, week by week, as, as you do different things. Um, and the idea is that people can access that cohort ID via JavaScript, and then they can advertise to you according to your to your um, flock ID, um, which sounds like a nice idea because it's not super personalized. It's like you are part of this group and we're advertising to the group, um, but um, there do seem to be some problems with that um, because of the fingerprinting that Mike mentioned and Jerry will talk about a bit later. Because um, with regular fingerprinting on the internet, there's like a, um, like if you try and get a fingerprint from somebody, you have like a really, camera, a really big group of humans that you need to identify like one person in. Um, but as soon as you have flock, the, the group gets much smaller because you have their flock ID. So it's like, oh, now I have a few thousand people to choose from. So um, there are some very pe clever people working on this, but I'm not convinced it's a good idea, but there should be like, I, I do believe that they're <laughs> trying to find a workaround. So that's the one thing that is currently in test. Um, the other thing that exists and is cool and stuff is um, the conversion tracking API. Um, and this seems like a much better idea to me. Um, so I, um, so there's all sorts of pieces to it, um, like quite a lot. Basically, it's a way of, um, let's say you've got a, uh, a blog and the blog runs some adverts um, and the adverts are run by like, an advert company and they have a website and they're advertising for a shop that sells toasters um, or something else. Um, you'd, there should be some um, secure way for the blog to report to the advertiser, hey, I um, sent a bunch of people to the toaster shop and for, well, people have noticed the toaster shop thing, they've clicked on the toaster shop link perhaps, um, and you'd want the toaster shop to be able to say, um, like, these led to conversions. Um, I managed to sell some toasters. But, um, but it's with, so currently like third party cookies are the thing, um, and that sucks because it's very, very personalized and you can tell like um, far too much about the person and, and privacy matters. So um, the conversion API tries to get around that. Um, so as mentioned, there's a whole lot of different pieces to it. Um, only one piece is sort of out in the wild at the moment. Um, and that is to do with the tracking of clicks on anchor tags and window open events. Um, everything else is like still in a draft phase. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about that one for a little bit, zoom in. Um, so basically how it works is, um, I'll continue, like I wish I drew a picture because it feels like it needs a picture, <laughs> but I'm just gonna explain through interpretive dots. Um, so, <laughs> um, so we're gonna work with those same three entities as before. There's a blog, there's a shop, and lastly, um, there's the advertiser who's trying to join the dots there. So the blog gets some money, um, they get to survive and blog some more, and um, the toaster shop gets to sell some toasters. Um, so generally what would happen, um, or how this would work would be um, the advertiser would um, expose an advert and that advert would be put into the blog, the blog website in an iframe um, or something similar. And that inside that iframe, there'll be an anchor. Um, that anchor would point to the shop. So now people on the blog can click on the advert and go straight to the shop, um, which is great. And that's like a totally normal thing. Click on the ad, you go to the things you're trying to buy. Um, now where the attribute, where, yeah, so, then on the anchor tag, there's a little bit of extra information um, to do with the, the session in play. Uh, so, yeah, so it'll have a whole bunch of different things. Like, I had to write it down so I'd remember. Um, yeah, so it'll say like where, um, it'll have an ID associated with it. Um, and it'll say like where, um, where it needs to report to um, like, like 
what what is the advertiser, what is the shop. So it keeps identifiers for all of that stuff. Um, and as soon as the user clicks on that link, assuming that um, all the stuff is turned on in their browser, I'm not sure if it is turned on in everyone's browser. Um, yeah, but when this thing works, um, as soon as they click on that link, that information gets stored in their browser. Um, and then they just go onto the, onto the shop and do shopping things. Um, now let's say this person like took a look around, decided that they wanted to check out some other toasters somewhere else entirely, and they left the store. Um, they, they check out a whole bunch of other things. Two days later, they come back to the toaster shop and they make purchase. Now they bought a toaster, wonderful. Um, on the toaster like checkout mechanism, um, there would probably be a tracking pixel or something like that. Um, and that would point back to the advertiser. Um, and what it would do is um, the advertiser would then be able to send a response that um, lets the browser know that attribution has happened. Um, like it recognizes that the toaster has been sold. Um, and basically it can say like, um, it'll be able to link a little bit of information about the kind of sale. So about three bits of information about the kind of sale, which isn't a whole lot. Um, and so it's not enough information to fingerprint a person. Um, and then um, it'll basically say like what, um, yeah, it'll have a, an event ID associated with it that it knows about from the original blog anchor. So that way the, the dots get joined, but um, the, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so actually, um, yeah, so the response goes to, uh, let me start again with the checkout. So the person gets to the checkout, they make a request to the tracking pixel, uh, to the pixel. Um, the pixel responds with the um, response that, that has a, a bunch of information in it um, that is then also stored in the browser. So it doesn't go straight back to, to the, to the advertiser immediately. It's just like hangs out in the browser for a while. Um, how long? I'm not sure exactly, um, but sometimes. So the idea is that um, by waiting before sending information to the advertiser, you can um, obfuscate the data a little bit. So they know a toaster was sold. They know it was because of an advert, but they don't know who did it, uh, like who bought it and, and that sort of thing. So that's it in a nutshell, but I think it does maybe need a picture. <laughs> Did you do you have a picture? Do you want to share it? Um, I have like some scribbles in front of me, but it, I think it's I don't think it's fit for human consumption. It's like it's pretty pretty bad, pretty bad. Um, yeah, this is a toaster. Can you see it? Oh, there. I, I feel like I've got um, a deeper insight into the mind of Sheena. Yeah, I'm a very visual thinker. It's important for me to draw toasters sometimes. <laughs> so there, was something, at it though. <laughs> there was something interesting that you said in terms of the conversion tracking API being mm. pretty complicated. Um, are you aware of the extensible web manifesto? Mm. Um, oh, um, <laughs> I know of it, but I don't know it. Yeah. So it's basically saying that creating these capabilities in the browser mm. um, shouldn't be opinionated and it should be as low level and granular as possible so that people can build on top of it and extend the behavior of the web. Um, so the, the fact that it's complicated is probably on purpose so that it mm. uses or it fits a whole bunch of use cases. And I can completely imagine that maybe mm. not maybe not this year, but maybe soon we'll have JavaScript APIs that completely abstract that or mm. server-side APIs that completely abstract the complexity of it. Like I mean, as anybody who has implemented OAuth from scratch by themselves knows, it's a pain, but it's trivially mm. easy if you use a, a library or provider. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. A lot of sense. Yeah. so I have a, a quick question for the group in general. So uh, just listening to what Sheena and uh, what you were saying now, Mike, about how it's extensible and everything. Um, so when you, when you were explaining cookies, the way you made them sound is pretty scary. Uh, like if you don't know enough about privacy and whatever, it makes it sound like, oh my word, these people are tracking me. I should be paranoid. But let's think about where cookies came from, right? Cookies came from a place where they were built for a purpose. They weren't built for this purpose. They were built for a different purpose. And 
the reason we needed them is because we needed things like logins and all of those mm -hmm. nice things on the web so we could make the internet better, make the internet work. Mm -hmm. But all of these things that we're doing now to stop cookies, won't those things eventually become cookies? <laughs> what, what, what cookies are now? I don't know. It's just it's just like something that I was thinking about as as everyone was speaking. It's just it's yeah. Not it just, it's just people will abuse it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so I, th I think simplistically, I think you're, simplistically right. you're right. Um, but if we take a look at the the larger picture, you know, because the same concerns used to be had for JavaScript and the JavaScript sandbox, and those have largely been shut down. So much so that we've got other languages and runtimes and things that are, are wanting to use the JavaScript sandbox, even completely outside of context, you know, using it on the server. Um, and I think that I think that's why standardization is important and that going slow is important so we can identify those use cases. Because there are a whole bunch of APIs that were added to the browser as capabilities that are not necessarily completely fit for purpose. They're really, really hard to use. So there's a there's a tacit tension between those two. And I think as we chase capability on the web and try and have browsers be able to do more and more and more cooler things, which we need to, right? To survive as an ecosystem, we're gonna, like you say, increase that footprint. Um, so you're right, mm. but I don't think yeah. we have a choice. <laughs> yeah, in, in increase, you know, increase the possibility for people to abuse it. I don't know if there's anyone else. So I'm thinking about this. Thinking, um, I don't know if you can hear me properly because I lost my headsets, but um, the idea of having to, the original idea of cookies and it having to be able to extend the web and all of that, and as Mike says, like there was lack of standard, standardization. Um, what I'm hoping and thinking that we're trying to do and move to right now is that, yes, there's a, the right or standardized level of collecting information so that we can still achieve the goals that we want to achieve right now without having to add extra information that, um, in after it evolved, it started being used, I would say, for malicious means or uh, things that um, users did not sign up for. So maybe, yes, in the future, they become cookies themselves. But the idea is that they are not um, they ha there's a standard behind it. There's accepted content inside of it that everyone who signs up for it is comfortable with the amount of information it's collecting about them and what kind of information is being used in 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 those uh, then or then cookies type mm -hmm. situation. It's not not having um, an alternative, but having an alternative that not only the people who use it understand it and also have access to know what kind of information is collected um, about them type situation. Yeah, because it, it kind of almost brings it back, I think, to what we talked about last month with the being able to understand versus being uh, using the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because all of us, ever since GDPR started in the, in Europe and now uh, Poppy here, every website has one of those except cookie banners. But most mm -hmm. people that aren't necessarily us who know about these kinds of things would just mm -hmm. click accept because they really want to read that news 24 article yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. You know? Make the box go away. Just yeah. make the box go away, yeah. And so then if you say reject, then it's like all of these yes. options sometimes, yeah. I guess There's it always challenge. comes back to making sure that people actually understand what they're agreeing to. Mm. So yeah. on that point, it's interesting. I, I have done so much GDPR training over the last two years, I could probably give GDPR training. Um, <laughs> but, but what's interesting about that example is that a lot of people just have a banner saying accept all cookies and all cookies are essential, which is not true, right? So unless you can mm. granularly toggle which cookies are for which purpose and let the user choose and easily go back, like there's, there's no compliance there, right? You're not actually doing anything, but the users don't necessarily know the distinction because it is a relatively techy thing to look for. Um, if there's anybody out there, if you go to a page that you don't necessarily fully trust and you don't see an option to manage cookies, assume that they're doing something wrong. Um, mm. And <clears throat> the, other, the other element of trust that's there is that when you see a pop-up that's got GDPR 
stuff on it. It doesn't mean that they're respecting that GDPR post, right? They may have, they probably have already contacted Facebook and Google Analytics and set cookies across those platforms. Like it's it's super, super, super common. Um, so we're, we're stuck in this, this between this rock and a hard place that um, even superficially complying with legislature um, doesn't mean that you're technically complying um, and users don't necessarily know the difference. I don't necessarily always know the difference. It's It's not easy to find. Um, um, yeah, scary. So I've got a question that I haven't been able to find a clear answer to. Um, so third party cookies, I think we can all agree those are crap and they should go away. Um, but first party cookies do sometimes have really useful use cases. So um, one example from my life is um, there's this web framework in Python, nasty Python named Django. and um, <laughs> and it's, it does some pretty normal things. It, um, it generates web, web pages um, on the server and then sends them out to the client. And there is no JavaScript involved. And so like the way it keeps track of sessions is with a cookie. And you can set it to be HTTP only and um, like same origin and all of that stuff. But it's like if those go away, and now we need to use something else um, and get access to local storage on the, well, like secure storage on the browser, then suddenly we need to have a JavaScript component associated with our like Django pages <laughs> that we're rendering on the server, which, which seems, yeah, it seems like it's going to probably damage a lot of people. Um, yeah. You raised uh, yeah. some PTSD of mine from back in the web form <laughs> days where view state was stored and passed around in a, in a cookie as well. Uh, and that, mm. that, that's pretty terrible. And I'm sure there are like, based mm. on my experience at corporates, there are still a ton of websites out mm. there that are fundamentally relying on that underlying cookie mechanism for mm. the day-to-day -day operations of like mission critical mm. systems. So yeah. <laughs> I would not like to spend my time upgrading all those uh, legacy mm. applications should that support ever go mm. away. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if um, if we, well, if, we, if the interwebs were to roll back and just say like, okay, no first party cookies unless they are HTTP only, then how could that be abused? Um, can it be abused? I suppose it would be open to man in the middle attacks. Um, mm. Yeah, so don't forget that Spectre is still very HBF much a thing. Mm. Pardon? But Spectre but is still very that. much a thing. Okay. So, so an important thing to remember is that, um, and and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think I'm right, but just double check me. Um, the the SSL transport or the TLS level transport for an HTTP response, the body of that response is encrypted reversibly, mm. but the headers are public oh, information no. and cookies are in the header. So okay. as well as the query string. That so like, okay. if, if you think about it, um, when you make a request and you're sending your seemingly innocuous cookie, even though you're mm. using HTTPS, every piece of networking infrastructure between you and your server can see what your cookie data says. Okay. Like, and probably is caching it. Okay. <laughs> and it's definitely, yeah. So, well, not gonna, definitely. Gonna have to but, fix Django. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so again, then we get onto the extensible web again. Um, <laughs> pardon me. So the, the idea being that there are APIs that are coming and the meta frameworks mm. like Django will use mm. those APIs appropriately. Mm. Now, there might not be HTTP driven only APIs, but what you'll probably find is in the future, Django will, um, or, or let's not talk about Django specifically, let's just talk about web mm. frameworks. There are, mm. and it's, it's beyond the scope of what we plan to discuss, but there are different ways of um, securing a user and session data for first party reasons um, that are not reliant on cookies, right? Mm. Um, we've got, and Rudy, I think, um, like, if I can hand over to you, you know we've got um, alternatives in terms of where you can put session data in the browser already. Um, so I will talk on a high level about what I know right now, because um, outside of like se session storage, where we could um, add information, 
um, that would be one of the places. Um, what I've also seen is like there's certain information that we pass in through the caching process. Um, so certain information can use caching to be able to um, uh, store information and um, kind of propagate that moving forward. Uh, this would be also data that we normally are already familiar with and information that we can already have access to. So um, it's relatively um, not evasive or like it's not too intrusive for the user, but use cases that we can currently use right now to ensure that um, we have some form of support to know which user we are referring to and whether or not, um, yeah, things that they get to do in our web application, basically. Um, but yeah, Sheena, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's also that uh, index DB thing that you can also use mm. as, as storage. I haven't, uh, you know, being mostly focused with Node and the back end, I haven't really had a chance to play around with it that much on the front end. But um, I've heard some interesting things about it. It's, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's more of a, a document DB type storage or key value type storage rather than like a, a SQL database running in your local. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do a lot of really interesting things with that. Uh, and then mm -hmm. I think there was also one more um, ca cache, cache storage. Uh, but uh, I have very little information about that. Yeah, so cache storage, I don't think would necessarily be the appropriate place to store this. I think session mm -hmm. storage or local storage are probably good ones. Um, yeah. And again, there are other APIs coming. So web, of, web of then, so the ability to, to log in people without needing to pass passwords around and use biometric data that gets stored on the device securely. Uh, and I think that's the end game. Um, it, it's relatively available. People can play around with it now, but I haven't seen anybody really using it in the wild. Um, I'd love to find out if anybody is using it. Um, and I think as a part of the privacy sandbox, they've also, they're calling it web ID at the moment. And if you can think of it like a federated meta OAuth, right? Where you've got your identity and then you can, um, I don't know, almost attribute logins to it. So that means that you're treating the browser as the thing that controls it rather than cookies. So you're you're almost at an arm's length. Like you don't have access to that stuff anymore. The browser has access to that stuff. And I think that's that that's interesting. It might be a, a thing, but I haven't done any research about that one particularly. Um, so one interesting thing on these, uh, which I guess is not really an alternative to cookies, but uh, StreamYard, this tool that we're using, um, they don't have a username, password, login. They have this thing where um, if you want to log in, you type in your email address that you're registered with, and they send you an email with a code, and you put that code from your email into, into the browser, and you're logged in. And I was reading on their FAQs about why they do this, <laughs> and pretty much the reason is they don't didn't want to use any external OAuth providers, and they didn't want to build their own username and password system, so they made something easier. And that's that's pretty much the what they reasoning behind the whole thing is. And I thought that was it, it's quite an interesting concept. Uh, I mean, very different to pretty much anywhere else you go these days. So. Another alternative, although I guess they probably do still more than some sort of cookie because I haven't been logged out since I logged in the first time. <laughs> Very now that I think point. about it. <laughs> um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you can respond to that, Mike. Okay. No, um, Rudy, go. I think we've touched on a little bit about this, but what I've seen through uh, my investigation that I've done is that there's different people. Yes, Google is probably the big name that is getting involved and getting everyone involved right now to talk and interrogate uh, their approaches and cookies and trying to find alternatives. But it almost seems like it's such a difficult um, problem to solve. Um, and at, and I think we've spoken about it earlier, so if this is a repetition, um, sorry about that. But like what why does it seem like it's such a, a difficult thing to solve what is it about um cookies and even though we have a fair understanding of what we're trying to do with it but then the 
the the companies that be and that different type of people find this a very hard problem to solve and why do you think that's the case there's a lot of incentive to break the system so yeah. lots of people try to um like there's there's big bucks in taking away people's privacy hmm. yeah some bad and if you think and... about it as Big sorry. companies, sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Those big companies are the ones that rule the internet and that's how they make their money. Mm. Mm, but also the other thing, and it's something we spoke about uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were all chatting, uh, is that it's not actually that fun of a problem to solve. <laughs> you know, it's not the most interesting work in the world. <laughs> yeah. I think also some frameworks abstract away from what's actually happening under the hood. Mm. Uh, and then you end up maybe not following best practice, not out of a sense of choice, but because it was the easiest default uh, to mm. actually implement. And it's like, you know, for example, um, a big fan of Feathers JS. Uh, it's a layer that runs on top of Express. And they explicitly store their JWTs by default, either in local storage or session storage. Uh, and they've got all sorts of reasoning and justification in their docs for how to do that. But, um, you know, from what I understand is one of the most secure ways to actually store your JWT is with the HTTP only. Uh, cookie so that third-party JavaScript libraries can't hijack mm. that JWT, even if it is only a short-lived one. And so I was like, let me see if I can go ahead and change this. And I think I spent about an hour on it and I was like, okay, the return on investment for this is just not worth it for the side project. Mm. So I'm just going to let it be. And yeah, you know, if I was working on a client project, on the other hand, you know, it would it, it would be a serious amount of work to actually find the right mm. way to configure that. There's also the option of having both a secure cookie, uh, an HTTP cookie and a JWT in storage, um, and then have them be different. And that way, like, you can't steal them both with the same mechanism. So <laughs> uh, there's a bit of overlap. So <laughs> yeah, the, the security system. hole is like a bit smaller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I think Mike was trying to say something, and then I spoke. Yeah, yeah, I was. So interestingly, I, th I think, and I stand to be corrected, but I think local storage is domain-based. So mm -hmm. if you're downloading a script from a third party, it's not going to have access to your local storage database. Ah, okay. Um, so I, th I think, I stand to be corrected, but I'm pretty sure that that's how it works. Because um, again, it's a slightly more modern API. So um, then you only have to watch out for your own developers. Correct, yeah. <laughs> and it, there's no, there's nothing, uh, <laughs> there's no cure for that level of malice or ignorance, unfortunately. No. Um, yeah, so, so it's interesting um, about first party alternatives. I don't think, I don't think it's the biggest deal at the moment. And those are probably the last of the cookies that are going to be shut down. Um, but again, it, it is a thing. Um, mm. Perhaps if we could if we could segue a little bit um, and talk about things that are are easy to see but are dangerous and malicious potentially is the idea of user fingerprinting using mm. the user agent string, which I think Jerry's got some more details on. Yeah. Okay. So the user agent string. So we 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 all as developers heard of the user agent string. It's one of the request headers gets sent with every request. There's, it's sent by default. There's no way to stop it from being sent. Um, it's sent to every website, every request that you ever send. Most people would probably know it based on having used it to exclude certain browsers from their functionality. Um, this is bad practice and you shouldn't do this. <laughs> um, there are alternatives to doing this and don't use the user agent string. But there's actually so much more than just what your browser is in that string. So there's your browser, the version of your browser, the platform you're running or operating system you're running, the version of your, the platform you're running, the device 
that you have, the exact version of the device that you have, um, and a bit more. So all of that thing is in this one string. And it was also like cookies initially developed to make the internet better. It was actually developed for security reasons. But over time, they've started using user agent strings to track people. And just from a user agent string, there was, I was reading a blog about this. It was a very interesting thing that the person mentioned on the blog. They said that just from their user agent string, they tried to fingerprint themselves and found that their device, the one they were writing this blog post on, was unique in 1.7 million other devices just from the user agent string. So, so that's how much information that one string can have. And a bit of Googling and looking up things about user agent strings, I came across two or three different blog posts teaching you how to use the user agent string to track people. <laughs> Te technical blog posts, like you would write a blog post about your favorite JavaScript framework, <laughs> teaching you exactly where to extract the data, how to filter it in, in one of them was in Python and the other one is, was in JavaScript. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's quite, quite interesting. So one of the parts that's really scary about it is that a lot of people who are very privacy conscious uh, disable third party cookies on their browsers so, so that people can track them. They, uh, or they use more secure browsers or they use VPNs so people can't see their IP address. Uh, they block location. You know, being you can be the most privacy conscious person but they still have your user agent string, no matter what you do. So they can still pinpoint you at least uniquely to 1.7 million other people. It's, what if you set up Fiddler to interact with your traffic and change the user agent string for every request? Yes. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> then, then you need a way to for that. <laughs> So, so they use this information to just build up a general profile of who you are, right? They can't actually build as much information as a tracking cookie can. They don't know who you are exactly, but based on the information they get, they can put you in an age group because they know what types of people have that device and use that browser. They could figure out where in the world roundabout you live. You know, they could figure out uh, whether you're male or female, whether you, uh, uh, what kind of work you do even potentially based on your device type, or at least group you into sections. And then once you're in a group that's small enough, they can target ads at you. There are alternatives to user agent strings too. They are still very new. It's only, uh, I think it's only available in Chrome at the moment, but it's not under flag anymore. It is available. So um, it's called the user, user agent client string. And um, all it sends is it's also a header and you send it, uh, all it will send to the server is a browser name. So just your browser name, not version, not, nothing else. And then if you want anything else, you have to request it. And if you request it, you have to do it one, one item at a time. So if you want platform, you say platform and it will give back ver uh, Android or whatever. You know, then if you want version, you have to request it. So you have to keep sending requests, which would obviously like decrease your performance if you still want to track people. But yeah, um, so that's something that is available in Chrome. 
on Chromium actually, so therefore in Edge and most other browsers that come from Chromium. Um, Including VS Code. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's that's one alternative. But yeah, the, I thought uh, some of the stuff I read about user agent strings was quite quite scary. <laughs> Yeah, because it might you might be communicating between two trusted parties, right? Two people who mm. who are both completely trustworthy, but you might be routing through network infrastructure um, that is maybe not so trustworthy, and there's no control over that, and um, the user agent stream can be spotted. So uh, I think it's I think it's a good point. But um, to wrap up for the last fifteen minutes or so, let's let's talk about a difficulty of adopting this stuff, right? And I'm going to talk about browser support. Because um, this is being pushed very hard by most of the browser manufacturers, because the manufacturers themselves want to come up with a positive use case, um, lock down the negative use case, and not lose any revenue themselves. You know, like Microsoft and um, Google are both in the ads business. Um, and as is Facebook and the likes. So they've got this active interest in, in these standards being propagated out. But even then, like browser support is always a thorny problem. Um, and I think the fundamental premise of the thorny problem is that uh, big upfront design sucks. It fails consistently. Um, and the, the standardization process by its very definition is, is big upfront. They're trying to move away from it. But um, like I think, I think the long arm of the W3C uh, it moves really slowly. Um, although, yeah, it would be the W3C because this is HTTP, not HTML, so it's not the What Working Group. Um, and the it's an interesting one of differing approaches. There are some browser manufacturers like Firefox that want the standardization to be done before building anything, um, because. Otherwise, there's no standard. Um, and then there is Chrome and Safari, which do things very differently. So Chrome is very eager to push out these features behind origin trials. Um, so you can sign up for an origin trial for your domain. And then if people are using Chrome, these features will be available to you. Um, you could also just switch on flags on your own Chrome instance. But like you can't ask users to do that up in the wild. So origin trial is the only feasible way to test it. Um, <coughs> Uh, so, so yeah, we've got this tacit tension between um, different methodologies in terms of how software gets delivered. Um, yeah. Discuss. When can we use this stuff? Well, one of the things I found quite quite cool when, when looking into this stuff, actually quite interesting with what you were talking about, the origin calls, is um, even though uh, Edge is the blue chrome, uh, they're uh, they're based on Chromium, right? So so they're. Uh, but what's really cool about it is that the two teams, Google and Microsoft, are working on different part, solving different problems, and then contributing contributing both, both contributing back to Chromium. So so it's not like you know they have to solve the same problem multiple times, which is kind of nice because because then there's at least people approaching it from different angles. So there's different opinions. And I know, like, I mean, I'm sure there's people who've worked on bro bo both at Google and Microsoft on the same thing. But but at least there's, like, different opinions for it, which is which is good because it would, it should drive at least that part of it forward. Yeah, that's an interesting, it's an interesting point, right? And I think overwhelmingly, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a little bit. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why standardization um, will always, should always trail open source. Because open source mm -hmm. is independently viewable and auditable. And you can scale beyond what you're prepared to put in. And I think that's one of the big mm -hmm. reasons why Microsoft went to Chromium. Um, so that you know we're, we're all working on this together, and you've got two major corporations that are that are both uh, checking one another out, so to speak, and making sure that everything is above board. Um, but then, in the positive use case, they're both working on different features, so you've doubled the 
the landscape of users that you can access. Um, oh, sorry, uh, developers that you can access, which is which is wonderful. Um, yeah, it, it it makes for more solutions to the problems we have. Yeah. Although this problem, I'm not sure. Yeah. So so th therein lies therein lies the the other issue is that so there are origin trials and testing of this feature so it can inform design, right? But if people start relying on the, the design and they then discover something, it's a long road to plug that hole. Um, you know, even if you can see the bug and it's a trivial fix, uh, you can't force people to, to update their browser necessarily. Um, mm. Anyway, but interesting food for thought. I think um, there's yeah. this tacit tension between standardization and open source that we, we have to acknowledge. Yeah, I think um, you know now with uh, Edge moving also onto Chromium, we've got Firefox and Safari as the only other competitors. Otherwise, you know, it's it, there's pros and cons for having a single standard versus competing. And I think we go through these waves where everybody diverged. Like, I mean, Mike, you lived through the JavaScript explosion where there was a new framework every week to do, you know, whatever. And now we've kind of got three that we've settled on it's uh, you know react view and angular and that'll be stable for a little bit and then people will be like no nah, this is rubbish we got to do something else and uh, it'll like, happen again and it's uh, it's interesting to live through these phases as you get more experienced as a developer I, th I think that's a that's a good point something that blows my mind is that a lot of the people that I work with didn't write websites before react was a thing you know, that was that was twenty fifteen, so that was six years ago. Sure. And if you look at the if you look at the graph of years of experience versus numbers, um, it's very heavily skewed to three to five. So the vast majority of people who are seniors have never had to work in the old world, if that makes sense. So I, I, You're just making me feel again, that's all you're achieving. Thanks. I, I, I'm glad. I was trying to um, because you're hiding the gray hair that underneath the beanie. So there's, there's no hair underneath the beanie. <laughs> oh snap. There's no hair to go gray. Sorry, bud. Those people don't even know what jQuery is. <laughs> <laughs> Never put together a knockout uh, JS website. Jeez. Knockout was great. It was knockout was truly, it was truly innovative. Work. It was really, really great. Like it's yeah. yeah. And and we're, medium, we're getting medium medium cool. <laughs> Yeah, we do that. <laughs> nice. All right, so um, I think, does anybody else have any questions or comments? I don't see any questions from um, the stream, so I think we can we can wrap up. I think it's an interesting space. Um, I think Google has probably been the most vocal recently that this is, this is legit a thing that they're going to do, um, but turning off cookies violates the number one rule. Jerry, what is the number one rule? Break the web. Don't break the web. <laughs> So, so it's complicated. Which is why type of null is still object. Yeah. We're not going to get into flat yeah. app now. All right. <laughs> Sorry, just speaking of the number one rule, it's 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 again it talks to what you were just saying, like like where they can, we can we can build we can build these new things. We can, uh, but but we can't bug fix because we can't break the web um so it's it's quite crazy like it's it's very very difficult i have a question we've, we've got a question from the chat it's ah. hey um thanks for joining us so this is a very very good question right because anybody that's tried to visit a news article site, right, that has put up a big stinking cookie banner in front of you and said that basically, unless you accept all of our cookies, um, you can't use the content, which they're within their rights to do. But that's by definition gatekeeping. You can't access this resource or this information unless you're prepared to have your privacy violated, um, which is fascinating. Yeah, I, I just leave websites like that and look for a different one. Yep. Mm. Close browser tab, go to a new one. Yeah, yeah. medium.com. But again, that speaks users. to. Sorry, Ryan, carry on. 
No, I was saying medium.com also uses that to try and enforce their paywall. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can, when you, once you reach the limit, like not that I would ever do this, but you know, a person <laughs> could hit F12 and go into their cookie settings and, you know, just, just wipe it out and cookies. carry on easy. You know, that, that's kind of why you can see they keep trying to push you to log in so that they can track it against an actual entity as opposed to a cookie. So it's, a, it's an interesting mechanism. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think that that uh, also speaks to the like we would clo close the the window and not accept the cookies if they do that right because we understand what's happening but again there isn't there's people who don't know and they'll just click accept because they really want to read that article uh, or that's the recipe they found for whatever they're making banana bread I don't know <laughs> this is the new trend <laughs> that was a very specific example Jerry is there something you want to tell us <laughs> it was the last lockdown thing. everyone was making banana bread in the last lockdown I thought that was pineapple we're in bread. lockdown again so. and sourdough like or <laughs> maybe there were <laughs> doubles <laughs> different people doing different things <laughs> Sourdough was popular in my circles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody. This was a, a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I hope the audience enjoyed it as well, and we answered some questions. And even if they didn't, I enjoyed hanging out with you. So, um, yeah, it was lots of fun. And yeah. um, Rudy, we have another. Sorry, Rudy has a question. Yeah. yeah. Before we jump off. Um, and I want us to put us in a, in a situation where we were so solving for this kind of problem, right? But in um, the promises of the future, ideally people also do the things and sign up for things that they don't understand for convenience um, so that the web and everything can think for them so that they can just click a button um, and proceed, right? So, and the idea is that we are moving to a world where we want um, something to estimate that I need milk in my house so that it will go and log a, a request to Amazon or Woolworths and say, hey, I need milk delivered at my house, ideally, you know, the future. Mm -hmm. What is it that you would do as the, um, the panel speakers right now to cater for situations like that without invading a user's privacy? So do you mean people ticking the I accept T's and C's box um, without reading things? Or so, um, do yeah. you mean that or like the automated, like the shop knows that you don't have milk in your fridge? I want the automated, I want milk in my fridge approach, but without you invading my, 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 my data or, um, you know, doing something with, with malicious. For this. Without you know, knowing what kind of milk I like. Yes. Sure. Or That's without going to <laughs> me and my banking details and things like that. Because like the idea is that um, these things are put in place. They have to collect information to make it possible for applications and websites to do this thing. So if you are subscribed to Woolworths, you want to um, give it information so that it can deliver the milk for you. But how can we do that if we don't collect information about a user? Yeah. Let me unmute first. It's an interesting point, and I think that these APIs are supposed to surface that sort of, um, or at least try and engage with surfacing with very specific targeted um, user-centric ways of capturing data. So putting it in the user space, letting them make an informed decision about what they're doing, and then saying, you know what, I'm actually okay with Willie's delivering Willie's water to me once a week. Mm. <laughs> That was very specific. Yeah, no, it has to be very targeted, right? Like it has to be only the the thing that you want them to know about you. So I want the smoke. There's one more question uh, from Lebo. Let's quickly have a look. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've got a very simple pragmatic answer to this. You can use a third party service that's going to um, basically shoehorn in some privacy into your web application, or you can not set the third party tracking cookies, which is entirely possible. Like if you're talking about Google um, AdSense or um, Google Tag Manager or 
hell, even, even Facebook. There are ways for you to load up the entire page. Don't let any cookies be set and then have those cookies set as a deliberate action, you know, unfortunately. So the pattern of the big stinking pop-up saying add all cookies is unfortunately the best practice for the moment. Um, there are, the services that I was talking about, there are consent federation services because they can fingerprint you, right? They know exactly who you are. So when you go around the internet and you've already accepted tracking um, on one of the, the uh, ad publishers that will follow you around and you will always be tracked. Um, maybe not always, but, but which makes it difficult, right? So accepting those T's and C's has a, a long reaching arm that I don't think many people are aware of. Like mm. in some ways people are more prepared to accept that your phone is busy uh, spying on you and reporting that data back to Google or Facebook or whatever the case may be, when the reality is unfortunately a lot less sci-fi and a lot less entertaining. Um, and that's that you're choosing <laughs> to give the stuff away at every, yeah. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answered the question level. Yeah. Anything else from anybody else? Any more for any more? Okay, awesome. So um, rewind to the part where I say thank you all. It was awesome hanging out. Um, next month's Josie JS, we're going to do something a little bit different, and we're going to talk about architectural patterns that you need to know, um, which is going to be and interesting. Going to technically still be this month because today is the first of July, and we missed last week. <laughs> I just wanted to remind people so they don't think it's only going to be in August. It's going no, to be it is going July. to be in end of July. <clears throat> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Hey,